case file number 7, because we finished number 5 and number 6 in the two entries by Tabitha, but the date, March 10th, 2023. I never thought that I would go through such a scenario again. Going back to school wasn't something that I was planning on since I managed to get back to Earth, yet after the little helping hands that Henry and I were given, I found myself being reintegrated back into society. And I have to admit, I was terrified. I had many reasons to be. I had lost all my friends back in Warmire. Now imagine you're having to start yourself back from the bottom, become a new student, and you can't help but think to yourself, maybe I should just close myself off from everyone. But I made a promise to Henry that I would try my best to enjoy my school life. Standing less than a hundred feet away from the school, I closed my eyes and tried to remember who I was before. I was Samantha, a teenage hobbyist with a knack for making art. I had great grades, but it's nothing that would make me a student of the year. I was always a hard worker, and I loved getting male validation. I took a few deep breaths, remembering that I was way more confident, upbeat, and generally everyone's friends back in those days, but I don't think I would do that this time around. When I approached the front door of the school, there were dozens of the other teenagers rushing past me. It's strange. I'm 17, yet I feel like I'm an old woman already. I moved through the hallways as if I was a phantom that no one could pay attention to. Blending in was so easy when everyone is so preoccupied with their own agendas in mind. I retrieved my schedule and went to my first class. AP Calculus as a start, mostly to put in some extra hours for when calculus becomes a real issue. In there, no one noticed me, but I guess we were all just trying to get some extra time in. The real change to everything came about when I went to my second class, history. When I walked in, nobody seems to take notice of me yet again, so it was easy to slip into my seat and listen to the teacher talk about human history. Now class, we're going to the museum tomorrow, so I hope you all have your permission slips from your parents today, because this is your last chance. But then she looked at me, and her face brightened like she had just remembered something important. Oh, that reminds me. What startled me is that she made a beeline right to my desk. Samantha, I'm well aware that you're a new student here, and you weren't aware of this. I'll make a special exception for you due to timing, so if you could bring it tomorrow, that would be fine. I nodded quietly, and noticed that the girl next to me heard everything. So you're new? She said. Again, all I could do was nod. I can't believe I'd become so incapable of socializing. My name's Brittany. Samantha. Don't worry, girl, I'm not going to bite. Well, probably. She ended with a little laugh. I understood that she was joking, but even the idea of being bitten brought up a few bad memories. I couldn't believe how hard this was. This nice girl was talking to me, and I couldn't muster up the strength to be my old self. At this point, I was under the belief that the old me is dead, and that I can never return to who she was. After class was over, Brittany came up behind me, and had a good few inches over me. She was dark-skinned, with long, puffed-out hair, and had the cutest pink skirt. Then there's me, a pasty white girl with large glasses and aqua green shorts. Our fashion senses were definitely going to differ by a large margin. So would you leave before? Warmire, I said weakly. She scratched her chin, trying to think of the name. But I kind of knew she wasn't going to get it. Warmire, that's some sort of small town, she asked. It doesn't have a big population anymore. Well, regardless, I'd like to welcome you. I like the artist style that you got going. I was flattered. It was nice to finally get compliments again, and not just from Henry. Come on, she pulled ahead of me. Come meet the rest of my crew. Her bright smile and cheerful voice carried in the hallway. I followed from behind like a scared puppy until we came across four other girls that were standing near a vending machine. There was a brunette who obviously was dyeing her hair green, but it was cut about neck length, and she sported jeans with a large blue sweater that seemed a bit too big on her. Her name was Elizabeth. There was a lighter, dark-skinned girl with flashier clothes than Brittany was wearing, and her hair was tied up in a ponytail that stretched down to her back with a few red highlights hanging from a few loose strands on the sides. Her name was Lully. 
And of course, there was a taller, brunette girl who seems to have a much more muscular build, which suggested that she did some sort of sports, but she was also highly intelligent when I happened to notice her large handbag had a Calculus 2 book in it. Her hair was also much longer, coming past her shoulders, and she had a wide smile that put me at ease. Her name was Megan. And finally... The girl who stood in the back was a Middle Eastern girl dressed in a hijab, but wore a skirt that only came about the knees. She also had a scooter leaning against the lockers. Her eyes were a lively green color. I would later find out that she's actually Kurdish. Her name was Aaron. Hey, Brittany hollered to them. I watched with curiosity as the girls interacted, not really sure what I was supposed to do since, back then, most of my friends were boys. I hardly ever had many girl friends, except for the few that were in my art classes. Those girls were nice, and that memory only served to depress me further. Introductions were in order, and that's how I learned everyone's names. Brittany appeared to be the leader of this group, and she explained to me that they were outsiders to the school. When I asked her to elaborate, she explained that every girl except for herself was a new girl throughout middle school and high school. Megan was the first friends that Brittany ever made in middle school, with Lully being the youngest, only having a few months over me. They were an extroverted crew, except for Aaron, who appeared to be the most reserved, but when we went outside, that changed when she showed me her scooter tricks. I never learned much of a sport other than one year of soccer. Overall, they were really nice, and they wanted to include me in everything. We even went down to the local Dairy Queen, despite how cold it was out here, where Brittany paid for all of us. I found that she's actually pretty well off compared to us, although I'm likely the most broke of the group. I opened the door to the cabin and felt amazing. My hands were a little shaky, but I think that was the excitement of finally making friends again. Although, I'd still like to have my old ones. Henry was at the dining table with a bunch of papers thrown about and a laptop opened, along with a bottle of gin. Working another case? I said. Yeah, uh, Cushion was supposed to help me, but he's off in his little dungeon downstairs. I think he's mad because he can't seem to sense this entity. What is it? It's a missing children's case. A bunch of children have gone missing around the United States in large quantities, but for some reason no one can remember exactly how this kidnapper's doing it. It's like a memory filter was put in place. Whatever this thing is doing, its trajectory can be predicted to be coming around our area soon. I have had too much fun today to really concentrate myself with Henry's job. Granted, it's my job too, but I also have school now, which means I would have to take a back seat. Which is good, because I still haven't quite recovered. Thankfully, that's what the school counselor's for. He's also on Mr. Ensley's payroll, so I was able to go to him about the more unfortunate circumstances that I had to live with. Honestly, I wish I could see him again right now. Oh, um, can you sign this? He was barely looking up from his laptop when he said, What is it? Permission slip for a field trip. He signed the paper, still too focused on his work, and I went to my room where I promptly got ready to do homework for the first time in almost a year. I stood in line as we were boarding the bus. The freezing air outside was annoying, and I had forgotten to wear gloves. Behind me was Aaron, and in front of me was Lully. The two girls were constantly asking me questions about things I liked but my old reservations had returned, and I was light on the details. Where's Warmire? Lily would ask. I noticed that you constantly check up on the sky. Aaron would remark. I felt so sad again. Well, not necessarily sad, but on my initial day, I was trying to put on the act that I was going to be a normal teenage girl, trying to get through her last year of high school. I had missed an entire grade, and now I was going to have to catch back up. Aaron and Lully were nice girls, but I really wish Brittany was here right now. She always took the lead in conversation, and I didn't have to involve myself too much. When it was my turn to get on the bus, I immediately sensed that something was wrong. The bus driver had a face mask, sunglasses, and a hat, all black, and purposefully trying to hide his unusually white skin. I mean, he was pale. Another thing that I felt off about was the small, pointed rock that was right between his feet. It had strange markings of a language I did not know, and I began to formulate that there was something sinister about all this. But then Aaron gently nudged me forward into a nearby seat with her, 
so I wasn't exactly able to continue calculations before she preoccupied my mind with talk. Is Warmire from another country? I, uh, no, uh, no it's not. It's actually from Colorado. I accidentally said too much. Oh, um, how strange. I'll search it up on my phone. It never occurred to me that I needed to be subtle about where I originally came from. I wasn't inclined to be secretive, because I never really expected anyone to care too much. But Aaron typed in the name of the city and got no results of a Warmire, Colorado. You're lying, she said sassily. It's a small town, I said uncomfortably. Thankfully, Elizabeth poked out from the seat behind us and said, Who cares? Samantha hasn't noticed that Travis has been watching her the whole time. I wasn't sure who Travis was, but they pointed me in his direction. When we met each other's gaze, I wasn't impressed. He's no Jack, although I'm glad I'll never see him again after what happened. Travis was blonde, hair slicked to the side, standing at about 6'2". He had flashy clothes, a black t-shirt with a velvet-colored jacket wrapped around, and jeans that were purposefully torn to appear stylish. I never was a fan of that style. Brittany poked her head out from the other side of the seat as well and said, Yeah, steer clear of that guy. He's one of those types that brags about all the women he's dated in school. I should know. I was his last victim back when we were freshmen. I was well aware of how high school can be. I did spend my freshman and sophomore years there, and yes, I have to admit, I was one of those girls that enjoyed the company of a bunch of guys. But my heart still aches. I didn't even want to think about dating. Hopefully, Travis understands the term no. The bus door closed, and everyone was firmly seated, starting our drive. For the most part, I was still distracted by the girls to continue my observation, but I could swear there was a slow glow of purple coming from the bottom of the driver, and there was no teacher on this bus either. Now I was becoming highly suspicious. Something was wrong. Instead of following the bus in front of him, he made a sharp turn down another way and had taken us down a lonely country road instead of the highway. Hey, I don't think this is the highway. I got up from my seat. He replied, All students should remain seated while the vehicle is in motion. He sounded inhuman, and alarms were ringing in my head. I had become paranoid, but that will keep you alive in my line of work. Stop the bus, I shouted, catching the attention of all the others. Travis got up. Whoa, chill out. I don't think you want to start a fight with a bus driver right now. I raised an eyebrow at him, already feeling the condescending tone. He reminded me of another guy who was like this back in my old high school. Yeah, I'm going to be kind just this once and tell you to sit down. I angrily remarked before marching toward the bus driver. Pull over. I'm breaking the rules. I said harshly. No. no. He said like a robot impersonating a human voice. No. W what do you mean, no? The sacrifice will be made. His voice distorted. Immediately, I knew something was wrong, and I spotted the stone at the bottom glowing yet again, this time much brighter than before. I said, defeated. Oh no, I have Henry's luck. The glass on the windows started to get painted a strange color. Purple light flashed in, and everyone was screaming. I was tossed away, trying my best to hang on to the driver's seat until I ended up being thrown into the seat of two guys. I couldn't see anything, but the screaming wouldn't stop, overwhelming me and triggering some bad memories about the day Warmire vanished. We were briefly weightless, a familiar sensation, until there was a forceful jolt that threw everyone up from their seats briefly. Everyone was trying to get their bearings, and I was trying to overcome my disorientation until I heard the door of the bus open suddenly, and the trotting of feet far off outside. Wait, don't let him- I reached out my hand, but fell to the ground, hard. He was gone. Our bus driver had vanished. Are you okay? One of the guys who I previously was stuck on said, I'm fine, thanks. When I got to my feet, everyone was looking out the windows. I turned and saw that we weren't in Colorado anymore. Outside was a beach, but there were dozens of shipwrecks and planes that had washed up on the shores of this island, and there were quite a few other school buses and cars that surrounded us as well. Well, I wasn't expecting a trip to the beach today. Brittany made a nervous joke. Travis got up. Where are we? I don't know. 
I said. Right. You get into a fight with the bus driver and then suddenly we end up here and you have no idea why. Don't give me that. He got angry. I swear, I don't know where we are. I don't know if we're still on Earth. What do you mean by that? He started to get hysterical. Brittany and Elizabeth got up from their seats, quickly maneuvering themselves in between Travis and me. Brittany, what are you doing? He suddenly changed to a much cooler head. Don't try your sweet talk on me. I'm not going to let you hurt my friend after you used me for your own bragging rights with the boys in the showers, since getting attention from girls is all that you're good at. He clenched his teeth and looked like he was about to raise his fist at them. But surprisingly, another boy grabbed hold of his arm. Knock it off. I don't think we're on Earth. He informed. He was a lot shorter than Travis, but he was way more handsome and had a good build to contend with. He had these sharp-looking emerald eyes with a yellow blend near the pupils, which I felt was a unique thing to see. But he also had an apathetic expression. Wait, how do you know that? I asked, realizing what he said. The sun isn't blue, right? He pointed out towards the ocean. There were thick clouds, but somewhere there was a clearing far off in the distance which revealed a dark blue star. It wasn't bright, either having a brightness only comparable to the moon. You could even see a bunch of solar flares exploding out from its surface in a wispy spray that danced across the skies around. This is weird, but we need to get that rock back, I said under my breath. I was the first one to exit the bus, with my new friends following, but in a way where they were definitely hiding behind me. Travis stepped out from behind them, followed by the rest of the class. Already, I was distinguishing myself. My natural instincts for this type of situation were kicking in, and I was feeling more at home than I'd liked. The others were definitely catching on to this mannerism of mine, and were being drawn in by whatever decision I chose. To the left was a beach, a rocky shore with a few patches of sand here and there, and gigantic monoliths made of black marble and shaped like hexagons that slowly shrunk near the top into the tip of a pyramid. But to the right dense jungle of palm trees and large ruinous structures of an unknown design. In fact, I would say it was almost headache-inducing trying to understand the weird shapes that these broken pillars, bridges, and walls were even supposed to create. One girl who was near the back started to cry. Then a few more, including one of the football players, also started to cry out, receiving scorn from Travis, who called him a big baby even though I could see that he was having a hard time keeping his composure at the sight, too. I pulled away towards a rock that had a strange symbol carved into it. It had a purplish glow emanating from inside the curving, and I almost felt like I could hear the sounds of a call. A wailing call. I was about to reach out and touch it, but quickly felt someone tug at the back of my shirt. Don't do it, Arian said. Don't do it. Aaron said, on the verge of tears herself. Sorry, I almost heard something calling to me. From what I've heard from Kushum, this is a unique type of technology that is harder for humans to comprehend. Technology works like a cycle, but it gets better each time it passes the cycle. It goes Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron, Steel, Industrial, etc., etc., but once humanity enters the Quantum Age, our technology will transform into something extraordinary. Stone Age again, but with quantum physics. And by then, humanity's brains will have changed, and our comprehension of agriculture, literature, and all aspects of human society will become more abstract and beyond comprehension. That's what happens to his species. In fact, he says lots of rival aliens during his time would go through these cycles. And then it just loops, becoming more advanced to what he theorizes as infinite. He said that the humans of Earth regressed back to square one and haven't passed a cycle yet. Last time he was in contact with his race in space, there were two cycles ahead, with the rival species of cosmic humans who were apparently five cycles into their advancements. It's evil. This place is very evil, Sam. Aaron proclaimed. I grabbed her by the wrist and we moved back toward the group. She was letting out a few shrieks of terror, and I saw that not everyone was going to be as tough as I was. For me, this is no different than what happened in my city, except it seems like it's less slimy. Alright, since Sam is such an expert on this, what do you suggest we do? Travis condescended. While I was glad I wasn't going to be his next girlfriend, I could tell he still carried some weight because he was on the football team, 
But strangely enough, the other boy from earlier stepped in. He looked like he was on the football team too, but he wasn't friends with Travis. Well, since she's an expert, I think it'd be best if we listened to her more tentatively if we don't want to end up like that skeleton over there. We all looked in the direction he was pointing and saw exactly what he mentioned. The ragged, gaunt remains of someone who had died here. Jeez, you can be so callous, Arthur. Travis revolted towards him. I weighed my options. Obviously, I was going to need those who would relay anything that I said to the other kids. I was the new girl, so I didn't exactly hold much weight in everyone's eyes. It's the same thing. We'll get distracted by our own thoughts eventually, and the situation at hand will become less and less important. It happened to Jack, of course. I too fell victim to that mindset when all we could think about was whether or not we were going to get out alive and possibly date. Teenagers will be teenagers. Arthur, I called to him. He turns to me, his face stoic, and though his eyes had become colder than before. Let's try to keep everyone together. He nodded and quickly told the rest of his teammates to follow along with my plan. I talked to Brittany about what I wanted to do, and she said, So you want to go look for that bus driver somewhere out in the jungle? Why? He's the only one who has the Nexus gate. Although I'm surprised it can travel. It must be a portable variant. She laughed and said, I don't know what you're talking about, but as long as you know what you're doing, that's fine by me. You must be some sort of survival girl. I smiled at her statement, thinking that she has no idea about the horrible things that I have done to survive. Before any of us did anything, a few pebbles made a disturbed sound, and we all jumped when we saw a tiny creature in a burgundy-colored cloak standing on top of the rock that I saw earlier. Who are you? ordered Megan with her fists up. When he pulled back the hood, I saw that it was a creepy, red-skinned man. He had a long but thin nose, a single eye above it, and a mouth full of crooked teeth that were broken and stained green. His fingers were long and skeletal, the nails extended far out, and frankly speaking, he kind of resembled a goblin. But I knew this was an alien. Oh good, more children for the feast. There was a long silence between us before Travis joked. He's British? Megan, Brittany, and I had all our hands up defensively. I wasn't sure what the other two could do, but I knew I had the best shot at fighting him. Henry always said, Assume your enemy is capable of moving the stars themselves. Always assume. Never underestimate anyone. And always have a place to run away. Oh, oh, please do not fight, children. I am not the one you are seeking. This was already getting annoying. He's one of these types. The cryptic, borderline, if not entirely insane, informer to the actual threat that we're looking for. He's even talking like a crazy goblin. And what exactly is it that you have to play in this? Megan questioned. He cackled. Nothing of the sort. I merely love eating your remains after he sacrifices you to his delusional rantings of a being that exists inside his head. I got up in his face. Who's he? He is the last of that silly order of mind jumpers. I'm simply the last of my race, enjoying the plentiful bounty of humans that he brings here. I had many questions, but there was a disturbance in the air above. A plethora of furious cries approached us from the ocean. A dozen or more of these flying, faceless humanoids with skin as black as oil, bat wings that were silent as a breeze, paws that resembled that of a lion, and a tail covered in the only strands of hair on them. And with a darkness on their face that was so deep that it was comparable to staring deep into a black hole. That sounds they made wasn't coming from any visible mouth, which only terrified me more of how we were hearing shrieks from these creatures. For the time being, I would say that the slender-limbed creatures should be called Night Gaunts. This sent a few of my classmates to rush back to the bus in hysteria. I'd say about five of them managed to get on before one of those creatures landed in between the rest of us and the bus door. Everyone, grab a weapon and protect those who don't, I ordered. My group was further away from the rest of the class, so Megan, Brittany, Elizabeth, Arthur, Travis, and two other football players whose names I wasn't aware of, each grabbed a stick that we thought was thick enough to be a good enough blunt weapon. Stick in hand, I led the charge over to the rest of the class as we started waving our sticks high in the air. I hoped that these creatures were more animalistic and would be intimidated by what we did, 
but already there were flaws in my plan. Travis wasn't exactly looking like he wanted to go forward and save the rest. Brittany, Megan, and Liz were all for it because our green-haired friend Lully was using her own body to shield Aaron, who appeared to be stricken by deathly fear. We had to rescue them. I had to rescue them. Travis was in the back of our group, making the least amount of effort to swing at any of these night gaunts. I was probably the most vicious out of the whole group, but Brittany was surprisingly just as enthusiastic to scare off her adversary. Same with Arthur, who had a calm expression, but his movements were just as savage as he would jump high and straight up bash the heads in on those creatures. He seems to have no fear in him, and upon further observation, I almost felt like he had that hunter instinct. Sadly, one of the creatures crawled up inside the bus. The students ran to the back and tried to get the door open, but the night gaunt jumped them, tearing through their bodies like fruit inside of a blender, and leaving just as horrific of a mess as over the windows. My heart sank. I really didn't want to go through something like this again, but I can't be helped. The only thing that I could think of next was saving my group of friends and the remaining students. A night gaunt landed in front of me. Its faceless, featureless head was pointed in my direction, and it had three red splits appear from the center of its face. A greedy breath was sucking in my scent as it started to shake its head. I had a feeling that it was getting the same response as every other creature gets when I'm around them. They get confused about what I am. Master, what is your bidding? It spoke with a surprisingly soft voice from inside my head. They communicated through telepathy. What? It lowered its head, showing respect. You bear a similar smell to my master. Are you perhaps an offspring? A light bulb popped in my head, and I said, Yes, tell the others to stop attacking the humans. It will be done, he said, turning back to the others and flying up to inform them of his supposed revelation of my identity. But shrieks rang out from behind me as I saw one of the flying alien creatures grabbing Travis and pulling him high up. No, I shouted, but I guess this one hadn't received my orders. I heard the joyful chuckling of that little red alien again. Oh, I can't let any more of my potential feasts get taken away. Take this. He dragged out a long, bizarre-shaped weapon that resembled a gun. It was actually a laser cannon, but it had green-colored lettering of a different language and was made of stone. Not asking him any questions, I took the cannon, holstered it on my shoulder, nearly falling backwards due to the weight, and looked through the scope. Got you, I whispered as I heard the humming of the weapon and a huge kickback that I was not prepared for sent me to the ground, but the ray of green light shot a hole straight through the flying menace, instantly releasing Travis, who only fell about twenty feet. Not good, but also not bad, because he landed close to the soft, dirt section of the beach, brushing up against some of the palm trees. I turned back to the little alien and said, Thanks. Don't mention it. I want to make sure I have plenty to last me later. I'm well aware you wanted to eat us, but help is help. Cusham likely is wanting that same thing, but the current circumstances are more favorable toward him working with Henry and me. Another one of the football players rushed over to Travis, who had a bloody nose and a few cuts. Thankfully, other than that, he was fine. The rest of the night gaunts scattered and flew away, giving us time to recuperate. There was also the case of the dead inside the bus, as well as two other students who had been torn apart outside. I did some basic first aid, tearing off sections of my own clothes to make bandages. Thankfully, my friends and plenty of the other students were willing to take turns ripping off sections of their clothes, too. I, for one, have become accustomed to this sort of environment, and since I was the one who actually managed to kill one of those creatures, besides Arthur, who apparently had bashed the head in on one of the creatures... Well, we should be safe for tonight, but I suggest that some of us stay up and take turns keeping watch. Everyone agreed to my plan, even Travis, who seems to be out of it. He wasn't being his snobbish, arrogant self anymore, probably still shaken by his close encounter with death. I was perfectly fine with taking the first watch, but I was interrupted while staring out at the ocean by the footsteps of Arthur. He had his hands in his pockets, and the wind was blowing his chocolate brown hair around his eyes. He seemed to know a lot about survival in these situations. My dad trains me. I lied. 
Is that so? He spoke, lost in thought. And is it possible that training also included taming those beasts? He saw that, I thought, freaking out internally. But his face changed, and he said, Don't worry, I'm certain it was a case of mistaken identity, but I suggest you not let the others know about this development. People are quick to turn on those they don't trust, you know. I did know, as much as I really wish I didn't. I knew all too well what happens when people turn on each other. Quite some dark things happen. He walked away, his steps barely making a sound despite the rocky surface, and like that, vanished into the forest area. I was surprised by how relaxed he was, as if he knew there was nothing in front of him worth worrying about. He told me that I need to stay quiet about the bizarre encounter, and I would be wise to heed that advice. I don't know, Arthur, but something about him has already got me suspicious. I wish there was more I could ask him, but he has mental guards up that I could only dream of having. When it was my time to speak, I thought I heard the sound of soft sniffling by the bus. When I went to investigate, I saw Travis resting on the ground. When I looked closer, I saw that he was looking at a picture of an old woman holding a young boy and cat. Travis! I revealed my presence. He jumped, clearly startled by my interrupting his alone time. Don't sneak up on me! Sorry. Whatever. You coming over to brag about saving me earlier? He grumbled, and quickly put the photo in his pocket. No, but I did see the picture. I'm guessing the little boy is you. He looked like he didn't want to say anything, but relented. My brother and grandma. That's nice, was all I said. But I had a feeling that the crying wasn't because he was trapped here away from them. You'd think that, wouldn't you? He said. I moved closer and said probably the one thing he wished I didn't suspect. They're dead, aren't they? Why do you care? He turned from me to kick a rock. I'm quite sure I can relate, I replied. He looked at me funny before standing up quickly, appearing to want to run from the situation. Is that why you always flirt and date around? I said to get something out of him. He snapped back at me. How about you do everyone a favor and get us off this island or beach or whatever it is? I don't need to explain anything about myself. I shouldn't have butted in, but if it's one thing I've learned, most people aren't bullies because they're naturally terrible people. There are always circumstances that led up to them becoming the person they are. I was never truly offended by anything he said. I remember back when I was a popular girl in school. I had dozens of boys pining after me, and I loved the attention. Of course, that makes me wonder if I ever even loved Jack. Or perhaps I loved the idea of having that level of devotion from a boy like he showed. At first, anyway. Am I really different, then? I guess Travis and I are the same in that area, although I always used charm and was never quick to become hostile. But everyone's different. Plus, Travis will never have to deal with the events that happened when I found Jack again. You're right. I said. I'm right? He raised an eyebrow. Yeah, because when I was at my old school, I was also someone who loved to date around. I loved the attention of all the other boys and filled my life with the comfort that I would always receive the next you're beautiful or you'd make any guy happy. I was like you, but now I don't have that anymore. I'm negative. I can only think that bad things are going to happen to me and I'm just flowing through life, going from one life-changing experience to the next. And you know what? I went through something way worse than the current situation we're in right now. So be happy I'm here and know exactly what to do. I could tell that what I said was baffling for him, but strangely, he replied. Yeah, I guess so. All right, Samantha. I won't give you any more trouble. You do seem to have a handle on the situation. And for that... I'll let you make the decisions. But when we get back to Earth, if we get back, I want to hear more about how your situation was a lot worse. I stood there, quietly, watching as he left, and I had to think about what I would even tell him. Probably a lie. I don't think anyone should know what I've done and what I've seen. They'd never see me the same way again. We both walked back to the rest of the group, and I sat down next to Aaron. She was already fast asleep 
leaning up against Elizabeth and Lily. I was still nervous, though. Even though Arthur refused to go back to sleep, it wasn't reassuring enough that we were in safe hands. But I was tired after today, and needed to at least get a few good hours in before tomorrow's anxieties and dangers reared their ugly heads. The next morning was grueling. We had eaten the lunches that we had brought with us for the field trip, but that was only one meal, and a lot of the others messed up and didn't understand the concept of rationing. Well, I'd suggest today be the day that we go looking for a way out of this place. Brittany, who had garnered more support from the other students than I was able to, but I think that comes down to seniority. Still, ultimately everything was relying on me, and possibly Arthur, who I still have suspicions about. Everyone was organizing, and I was certain that I was going to end up on the exploration team. Well, uh, sorry I wasn't able to arouse the crowd, so to speak. A lot of them are still worried about going out there, she said to me. It's all right. I'm certain I can make do with the amount I have. That group in question was the following. Me, Megan, Elizabeth, Arthur, Travis, and three other football players who were loyal to Travis and, frankly speaking, wanted off this island as soon as possible. A group of eight was good enough for me, and the majority would stay here and keep each other defended. God, I hope they don't get attacked while I'm gone. Brittany, Aaron, and Lully are really great girls and I want to have more fun back on Earth with them. Surprisingly, the woods were not as dangerous as I would have expected. Arthur, despite constant vigilance, never seemed anxious about anything. He was relaxed, and it always seemed safe. I think one of the first signs that he was different was when we came across a rat that had five eyeballs that were erratically scattered about on its head, spouting out a web-like appendage from its mouth. It was dangerous, sure, but not much of a threat from a good kick. Yet, it was the only time I ever noticed Arthur become alert. I now have a suspicion that he possesses a special reactionary instinct that gives him an edge over the rest of us. I'd be smart to keep my eye on him. Regardless, we eventually came upon a series of bizarre structures of non-Euclidean geometry that hampered any form of exploration and retreat, if need be. All of us were finding it absurdly difficult to navigate through unusual and absolutely mind-boggling architecture that somehow was able to allow some of us to travel up while simultaneously heading down. The rubble was everywhere, yet somehow the properties of the long-lost city that we had found ourselves trapped in managed to retain whatever it was that made it grotesquely beyond any human comprehension. I could go on and on about how some of us became split up when we were right next to each other with angles that were horizontal one moment, then diagonal the next. Spires that pointed up towards the sky, yet to go inside any of these buildings, would result in one falling into a deep pit of an upside-down spire. All of this was too much for my first cycle human minds to get around, and I saw to it that most of us keep our heads preoccupied and not think too hard about it. It comes off as random mumbo-jumbo because the words to describe any of it are much too difficult for me to grasp. Strangely enough, despite some of us getting separated and calling out to each other, you'd find them suddenly on your left and then the next underneath you. So we made it a rule to keep trying to go in the same direction until, after a few minutes of moving forward, we found ourselves walking out of the same hallway that was shrouded in a thick blackness that receded when we reached the exit. Arthur was first to reply. I don't even want to know what this place is. It feels familiar, and at the same time, I can't help but dread it. I said to him, Yeah, this isn't a normal place. Not even I've been in such a bizarre place before. We looked around the structure, exploring some of the beautiful, yet long-decayed architectural feats of this once-proud civilization. I spotted Elizabeth and Megan staring at a large mural on a wall. I took one look at it and immediately felt uneasy. My heart rate increased, and a bizarre feeling of panic was settling in. I could see it was on their faces, too. It looked like a heart covered in little hairs and eyes that varied in different, formless designs. Surrounding it was a whirlpool of dark clouds and red-painted eyes. There also stood a man beneath it and the maelstrom was stretching out pincers that would grab hold of other creatures and devour them. They weren't human creatures, but it seemed almost like an apocalypse might have struck this civilization at some point in history. 
Without warning, a bunch of rocks fell from a rubble pile behind us, causing everyone in the vicinity to jump into a defensive position until we realized who it was. It was the little red man again. Megan stood close to me. Elizabeth got closer to him and said dismissively, What are you even doing here? We're trying to escape this little nightmare island. He laughed. But I can't have my food escaping from me. Should a few of you fall, I want my first pickings. Besides, if you go further down this hallway, you will enter the chamber in which your enemy has prepared his sacrificial table. Good, I said, turning around and rushing headfirst in that direction. Megan called out to me, pleading for me not to take off like that. But I wasn't about to find myself trapped in another dimension again. It wasn't fun the first time, and it isn't fun this time. We already lost a few, too. I'm certain once we get back, things aren't going to be the same. I entered a massive central chamber. It had to be about a hundred feet high from floor to ceiling. The walls were made of strange murals, carved with symbols of a precise and completely unintelligible language. I would not be able to understand any of it except for one that appeared to be ten individuals around a table where there was a bunch of dead animals on fire. Above them was a gigantic hand in the sky with an object that was egg-shaped, but it appeared to be covered in metallic bands and gemstones. Ah, uh, it seems that you've made it. A hissed voice called out from the other hall opposite of me, stepping out from the shadows. What stood before me was not the bus driver. I now understood why he tried to cover up his face. His head was covered in feathers, his eyes solidly orange and glowing as well, and his mouth was full of needle-like teeth. Also, his skin was covered in calluses that functioned as armor, only missing his jointed parts. He was wearing a tattered, silky red robe with the hood up. So, you're the last one of some ancient religion here. Yes, I am the last. Well, why don't we talk instead of fight? I looked at some of the hieroglyphs on the walls. I think you need to use animals. He shouted. No, animals don't work. I've tried. I've tried hundreds of animals. Nothing worked. The old members figured it out, but never told me. They kept telling me I was the craziest of them all. But look at them. They're dead now. Finally, the others came in, and Travis stood next to me and said, Maybe because this religion's hogwash. I was inclined to agree, but at the same time, the universe is so much more insane than anyone could possibly imagine. You dismiss the things that I've seen, but it doesn't matter. All you can hope for is that my dagger can kill you fast enough. I kind of wish I would have brought that laser gun again, but it was way too heavy. Travis surprisingly stood in front of the group and said, Relax, guys. There's like one of him, and he's got to face off against a bunch of football players and Samantha. I highly doubt it'll be an issue. In fact, Jason, take care of him. One of the football players, a 6'4 African-American with a buzz cut and thickly tight muscles all over his body, cracked his knuckles and had a big smile on his face. His opponent was a 5'10, a scrawny-looking man holding a dagger of a weird design. I thought it best to warn him about it, but he seemed confident, and nothing's more dangerous than overconfidence and ignorance. I didn't like that dagger. It had a longer blade than normal, plus a series of cross blades sticking out from the sides, and looked designed to mimic praying mantis pincers. There was also a symbol carved into the handle. It resembled an egg, but the blade at the tip seemed to have a glow to it, a purplish glow, and a few sparks were falling off it. Jason, wait! He was right in front of the guy and replied, Samantha, I appreciate that you got us this far, but I really need to beat this guy into a pulp. My friend was on that bus when it... The alien pressed the dagger's tip against Jason's stomach, not even really puncturing it all the way through, but instead there was a large boom and a spray of blood and organs that had been shredded to pieces splashed out onto the floor behind Jason. We stood there, frozen with fear, when we saw that there was a large hole going through his abdomen and out his back. About five inches across, I would say. Poor Jason. He didn't react at all. Simply collapsed and died. Who's next? The man said, not really giving us much of a choice because he started rushing towards us. One hit from that blade, and it was all over. You might be thinking we thought that we should just overpower him, but everyone here are teenagers, and even I wasn't up to such a challenge yet. That would probably mean we'd have to sacrifice someone. 
and I really didn't want to lose my two new friends. I grabbed them, and we ran back towards the tunnels. Everyone split up, but we ended up hearing another guttural scream somewhere. Megan was crying, and Elizabeth was trying to catch her breath on the verge of tears herself. Of course, she had a different reason. She told us how she liked Jason, and although she wasn't brave enough to ask him out, she was hoping that she would notice her. I apologized to her, but she returned to her breathing exercises. Megan grabbed me by the shoulder. Sam, how do we get home? I don't want to get hit by that dagger. Well, I hesitated, but I was able to regain my own composure. But we need to find a bunch of rocks that look like they've been precisely set up. Think of Stonehenge. Still, I wasn't too certain if that was going to be the case. The man had a traveling one, and likely that was the only one that would be around here. Nexus gates are typically stationary until they're activated. Elizabeth peeked around the corner that we were leaning up against until she suddenly jumped back and started running, telling us that we need to move. We did, and not so much as a few seconds later, that man was behind us again, dagger raised high above him. I only need three more sacrifices. I wasn't having it, and when we were in a bright area for me to have a good look, I took one deep breath and stopped, my friends also turning around and screaming for me to keep going. It's okay. Find a rock with weird symbols or something on it. It's growing purple. I think that could be our way home. Just think of home when you touch it and get the date right. You never know if you might find yourself in the past or in the future. Megan looked like she wanted to stay, but Elizabeth pulled her and the two of them ran off. How oh, sweet. Want to sacrifice yourself to protect the others? He mocked. I am, because I'm not fond of saving others when I'm much better suited to straight up killing psychos like you. I turned around and clutched my fists tightly. I had to remember all the self-defense training that I had done back when I was in Warmire, not to mention the other training I took from Henry and Cusham. You're actually incredibly brave. I got the feeling you've been in these situations before. He took a stance, ready to begin our duel. You don't know the lengths I've gone to to survive. I gritted my teeth, ready for my fight for survival. I felt a rush of adrenaline surging through my veins. My feet were feeling lighter than ever, and old memories of surviving at those months in my lost city were coming back to mind. He lunged towards me, dagger coming down swiftly, but I was able to grab his arm and promptly headbutt his nose. I don't think he was expecting as much of a fight out of me as he thought. A miscalculation on his part, as I had grown accustomed to never believing that I was going to have an easy fight. Nor would I fight fairly. He still held tightly to his dagger, but his head shook as he tried to readjust his line of sight. I gave him a swift kick to the knee, throwing up one of my fists into his face, clashing against his jaw. Still, he did not fall as quickly as any normal human being would. He was incredibly durable. Instead of trying to stab, he began swinging the blade across back and forth in a panicked defense. I took a few steps back, trying to keep my distance. Another swing drew closer, forcing me to duck down and jump to my left. With a roll, I hid behind a low pile of rubble, forcing him to decide which would be the better option. Go around, or walk on top. That would give him the high ground, but I could easily take a few steps back to relieve him of such an advantage. He went around instead, having to exert himself to prevent me from escaping down one of the passages. Instead of using the blade, he tried to throw a punch, and it actually caught me by surprise as I felt his fist slam hard against my cheek. And then he threw a kick, aiming directly into my abdomen. This change of fighting forced me to adapt. Now I was on the defense as I tried to block his empty hand and legs, waiting for the moments when he would try to use the dagger again. Getting tired, little girl. He chuckled. I said nothing, swiftly waiting for the opportunity when he would be open to an attack. I waited, blocked, and waited. With his right leg resting after trying to kick me, I seized my opportunity and drove the heel of my foot into his knee, feeling something crack upon impact. A sharp cry escaped from him, and he dropped the dagger. When the tip hit the ground, a large hole, five inches across, exploded and dug its way down into the planet. The shock wave was enough to throw the dagger away from it and land a dozen feet away from us. I ran for it only to feel those callous hands wrapped around my left leg and pull me back, 
He crawled on top of me and tried to wrestle my arms down. What followed next was a headbutt from him hitting the back of my head against the ground and leaving me confused. You're way too good of a fighter. I hate it when they struggle. He hissed. Both my arms were knocked down, but now we were trapped. He couldn't reach the dagger, but I couldn't go anywhere. And then I remembered he had those teeth. Opening wide, he rushed towards my neck, forcing me to squirm to my right, sacrificing my shoulder instead. I felt his teeth dig straight through my skin and shred through my muscles underneath. I felt a warm spray of liquid, and I could barely even make a sound at that point. Almost instinctively, I was able to lift my right leg up and knee him in between his legs, which apparently works on alien men too. Now was my chance as he clamped up, clearly seized by the sudden jolt of pain. Unfortunately, that did nothing for me, because I also found myself unable to move. The excruciating pain from the bite and the dirty floor getting in caused a severe stinging sensation and a sudden emptiness in my stomach. My body was shaking all over, and my attacker slowly tried to get back to his feet. Enough. I won't put up with this any longer. He stood over and grabbed me by the shirt, causing it to stretch and tear as he held me up high so that my face was up against his. Now I couldn't help but worry about ending up shirtless after all of this, but also I didn't want to die. You're done now. He sat, opening up his mouth again with his new, bloody teeth in full view. With a loud breath in my face, he prepared to finish me off with a face chewing before I felt a sudden spray of warm liquid splash around my pants. His face also froze up, and he looked down at his abdomen. When I looked down myself, I saw a five-inch hole that had just bored itself through him. Blood was dripping down his mouth, and I was certain that it wasn't mine this time. His hand trembled, and he released unexpectedly, and I fell on my rear rather hard. Sitting back up, I watched as he dropped to his knees and fell backwards. His lungs rattled with death, and he died. It was Travis. He was holding the dagger. Are, are you okay? His voice trembled. I was breathing hard and still in shock. Yeah, I'm... yeah, I'm fine. He placed the dagger down and ran to my side. He held onto my arms and helped me get back to my feet. Thank you, Travis, I managed to say in between breaths. I happened to see you fighting that thing and I couldn't help but get him with the blade when I saw it was on the ground. He wrapped his arm respectfully around my torso and helped me up. We talked about what we were going to do next, only to hear footsteps from behind and the lifting of the blade. It's quite a fine artifact. Arthur's voice echoed. We looked at him, and I stretched out my arm, despite the pain in my shoulder. Arthur, what are you doing with that? I'm quite interested in such a deadly weapon. I plan on keeping it if you don't mind. Travis warned. Do as she says. We don't know how dangerous that dagger is. His cold, black hole-like pupils stared at the two of us, and he remarked. I'm not going to be stupid like you two. The next time something dangerous hits us again, I'd rather not be completely helpless in the next fight. I'm going to do what I please. We were left speechless, but relented. A part of me believed he was right, even though it's dangerous to have it. It might also be valuable, as long as Arthur's intentions are not hostile to us. I still wish I knew what was going on in that head of his. He had a unique darkness about him that seemed so... Inhuman. The three of us walked around for a while, picking up some of the other survivors. Although most of them survived, we all shared in the pain of losing two of the others. Travis seemed most hurt, because they were his close friends. Arthur looked more reserved to express anything other than distant resignation. But the good news was, Elizabeth came back trying to drag a rather heavy rock across the floor. It was the rock we were looking for. The next difficult part would be taking this back to the others so that we could return to Earth. Not only that, the girls had to carry me along too. Arthur, Travis, and the surviving footballer team both lifted the Nexus boulder back to the campsite, 
where we found everyone still safe. Jeez, what happened to you, Sam? A surprised Brittany said. Not my worst injury. I laughed through labored breaths. They sat me down, and I took a few more deep intakes before preparing myself for the incredible concentration that was needed to use these Nexus gates. Bring the rock to me, I said. Everyone looked around for it, surprised when we saw Arthur with his hands on top of it. No need to stress yourself out more, Samantha. I think I know how these things work. I shouted at him to stop, and a few of the other students tried to grab him, but it was too late. There was a bright flash that overwhelmed my line of sight, and I felt the ground beneath me change from rough stone ground to a smoother, concrete one. When my vision cleared up, I quickly scanned my surroundings and was surprised to see that we were back in the school parking lot. There were a few students and a teacher who were shocked to see us as well as the bus back. A male teacher came up to us and said, Didn't you just leave? We were momentarily speechless. And then the field trip teacher who was going on the third bus ran out to meet us. What on earth happened here? Why is the bus full of blood? What is... She paused and started trembling quite noticeably. At that moment, some students, including Elizabeth, Aaron, and Lully, started crying. Finally releasing all of the stress and trauma that we had managed to survive. Travis fell to the ground, exhausted and relieved to feel the earth beneath him. I understood that feeling all too well, but I frankly was too worn out to express any emotional response. For everyone else, it was a fight for survival. For me, it was a Friday in Warmire. The events that followed after our return were more mundane, but way more preferable. There was police involvement, questions being raised, and several students actually had to go through some psychiatric care. Thankfully, my girl group remained stronger than ever. We took comfort in knowing that we made it through that whole thing together, although I was still reluctant to inform them about why I was better prepared for the struggle than anyone else, barring Arthur. Although some students did mention me being well-adjusted to the tragedy, no suspicion fell on me thanks to the fact that I'm a teenage girl, and it was chalked up to my living in the woods with Henry. I passed it off as I always went hunting with my dad, learning how to survive off the land, which isn't untrue. Speaking of Henry, he was worried sick when he saw the condition I was in. He also hated the hospital bill that he got, but he stated that that was the least of his problems. It was quite unfortunate that I wasn't able to go right to Cusham first to heal me up. Of course, the whole incident was on local news, but it would be buried just as quickly, because powers were at play in making sure nothing like this got out to the masses. A few days later, I was in my bedroom, looking out the window and wondering about the world. I hadn't had many opportunities to think about everything that happens on Earth. The great cosmic strangeness of things that are beyond anyone's mortal mind that pass about through our world as well as the many other worlds that exist within our universe and beyond. But when I peered closer to the woods, I thought I spotted something. No. Someone. Under the dim light of the moon, I was able to make out that it was a familiar face that was staring at me. I felt my chest seizing up when I saw Arthur standing outside, deep in the snow. He was quite a distance away. I could barely see what face he was making but there was an unspoken realization that told me not to bother going down to confront him. He would be long gone by the time I got there. But I don't trust him. Not one bit. He still has the dagger, and somehow the Nexus Stone wasn't with us when we returned to Earth. And there's something else about him that leaves me terrified. Cushum can sense anything that steps within our land. There's no way he should be able to stand there unnoticed. I never broke eye contact, and I watched as he turned around, not even giving a second glance, before he receded into the shadows of the trees. I don't know what he's up to, but he's going to be on my radar. And judging by what he's doing here, I'm pretty sure I'm on his, too. <laughs>